Okay, g'day all. Welcome to another video. So uh, today I want to talk to you about um, C++ unions. Uh, a union is a special type of class or structure. It's a method for specifying user-defined data, except that a union can only hold one of its non-static members at a time. <laughs> that probably sounds a bit weird, but it'll all, it'll all make sense in the long run. What we're talking about here is using RAM as more than one data type. Yeah, that's pretty much what it comes down to. So with a union, we can allocate eight bytes of RAM to store a double, and then later on, we can use those same bytes of RAM as an integer or a float, that sort of thing. Uh, from the Wikipedia article, I like this. This is very good. A union stores a float or an int, where a structure stores a float and an int. Yeah, so if you define a structure with a floating point and a, an integer uh, member variables, you're going to get both variables at the same time. But with a union, it only stores one type at a time. So it'll store either the float or it'll store the integer. Yeah. Alrighty, here's a bit of a diagram. Um, it's not a very good diagram. <laughs> I'm not real sure why I made it. And this is slightly too... There we go. No, it looks worse. Anyway, all that I wanted to illustrate is this is RAM down here, 8 bytes of RAM. So you could use this 8 bytes of RAM as a double, um, or you might just use the first 4 bytes as an integer or a float, uh, or you might just use 2 bytes as a short or a character. Um, a union lets you do all of these things with um, you know, any particular spot in RAM, whereas you know, a regular structure or something if you define a structure with a double and an int, it's going to put the double first and the int after it in, in RAM. Um, the union puts them kind of all on top of each other. Weird. <laughs> uh, okay, the syntax. The syntax for a union is similar to that of a class. Um, I'll go a little further than that. It's exactly like the uh, like a class. So this is how you define a union just here. I'll, I might zoom in a bit. There we go. Uh, I'll copy this and pop him over here into C++. So I've got a bit of Visual Studio 2013 happening. Community edition. Um, the syntax for a union, you've got the union keyword just here, then an identifier that you're going to use for your new data type. So I've just chosen arbitrarily my union. And then you've got your data type. So I've got an int here and a float. Um, you can put your own user-defined data types here. So that could be, say, a class or, or another structure. Yeah, anything like that. It's pretty flexible, really. Uh, but very similar to a class or a structure in syntax. And the same with the declaration of an instance of a union. So down here I've got uh, a declaration of an instance called M uh, of that very union up there, my union. Um, exactly the same as a class. So you just say my union M and then you can set that member variable, say X to 100 if you like, just using the little dot there. Um, you can also do star, you know, you can have um, that sort of business if you'd rather use a pointer. I mean, it's completely up to you. Well, completely up to the circumstance, we'll say. Uh, yeah, but the syntax is pretty simple. Okay, but what's important is to compare a class and a structure versus a union. So classes and structures here are kind of the same, um, but let's compare them to a union. So we've got our union here, my, my struct actually, it's a structure at the moment. And I want you to put that into Visual Studio. Well, I'll do it for you if you like. Uh, but it's called my struct, and we're going to have a bit of fun with this just to see the exact difference between a structure and a union. union. <laughs> uh, print the size of this structure to the screen. All right, let's print the size of. What's it going to say? Well, you've got to use the right triangles for a start. My, well, you can't just... Size of my struct. All right, well, I'm going to give away the ending. Um, an integer is four bytes, a float's four bytes. This is going to say eight on the screen, I bet. Let's have a look. There you go, eight bytes. Okay, so a structure with an int and a float is eight bytes wide. Good stuff. What's the next question? Declare an instance and print the address of X and Y to the screen. All righty, let's make ourselves an instance of my struct. My struct, I'll just call it uh, M and... Let's see out the address of m.x. So that'll be uh, m.x, and I might put an end at the end. And we're going to want the address here. So I'll put an ampersand there to mean give me the address, C++. And if he's obliging, he will. And the other thing that we want to do is um, the address of the y member variable for that structure. And we hit a bit of play. 
Okay, there we go. So those are the two addresses there. That top one is obviously the address of X and the bottom one is the address of the Y member variable. So the important thing is that they're not the same. It's not the same address. Yeah, so um, X and Y member variables for a structure are not stored in the same place. All right, now comes now comes the tricky part. Now comes the difficult bit. <laughs> Change the keyword struct to union. Uh, printing size of an address again. So if we change this keyword up here to union, union R, we're no longer making a structure, so I might also change the name of it to my union, just like thither, and something like that. Okay, so now we've, now we've got exactly the same thing as before, except we're using a union instead of a structure. So the size of is going to be, well, let's just hit play, we'll see what happens. There you go, the size of the structure version was 8, but the size of the union is only 4. And what's even weirder is that uh, both of these variables, the X and the Y, have exactly the same address. Look at that, C double F 974, that's um, obviously hexadecimal for um, whatever the address of the variables. This int and this float are in exactly the same place in RAM. Now that's a bit weird. If they're in the same place, uh, I mean, how could they take on different values? And um, they can't really, but this is really what a union's all about. It's about using the same point in RAM as two different uh, data types, an int and a float in this example. Okay, set the X value to 100 and print it to the screen. Okay, let's have a bit of a look. So, um, m.x equals 100, C out. Uh, m dot x. I'm gonna put an end all there as well. Semicolon. Oops. There you go. It just prints a hundred to the screen, as you'd expect. That was a good, good test. Uh, set the y value to one hundred point zero and print it to the screen. Um, okay. M dot uh, m dot y equals 100.0f. It's a float, that y value, that y value. It's a float member variable. And c out m dot y and all. And there you go. It prints 100 to the screen as well. Okay, so we can set x or y to 100, and it's just going to, you know, print whatever we set it to. It's funny that. Uh, but the next, the interesting part is um, what happens if we print X after we've set Y? Okay, so just here we've set Y um, as 100.0F. What happens if we print X out? I better put my handles on there as well. There you go. We get a strange number. We get a strange number. Why do we get a strange number? Well, the X and the Y variables take up exactly the same RAM. They're in the same place. So we can either be using that RAM as a float or as an integer. And the last thing that we did was set that RAM to the bit pattern for 100.0 as a float. And um, straight after that, if we try and print out the data as an int, uh, it's just going to print out whatever integer would happen to correspond with that floating point bit pattern. Yeah, so that's what's happened. That's what's happened. Uh, if you want, you can cast it. You can do a tricky, tricky casting here and um, print out the integer x as a float, which will give you exactly the same thing as m.y. It's going to give you 100. Yeah, there you go. So you can only use this union, um, this member variable, as an int or a float. You can't use both at the same time. It's either an integer or a float. Okay, that's really the point of a union. And uh, what we've just been through there is really all there is to basic unions. Uh, it does get slightly more interesting, as we'll see shortly, but um, some things to be careful of. Uh, union data members are public by default, like structures. Yeah, not like classes. So classes by default, uh, member functions and member data is all uh, private, but uh, for unions, it's public. Union data members cannot be reference types. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Unions cannot inherit from a base class, nor can they be inherited from. So you can't use unions in uh, class hierarchies, inheritance hierarchies. All good. All good. Alrighty, but moving right along. So what we saw just a minute ago is that if we use the 
unions data member as a float and then later on we try and print it out as an integer we kind of get nonsense data i mean it's you know it's not nonsense it's ieee 754 but you know arguably that's complete nonsense you probably want to keep a track of what data type a union was last used for so if you write a float to the union um you want to read it as a float or if you write an integer or a character you you know you want to read it as an integer or a character the trouble is that unions don't keep track of this information for us so what we've got to do is store this information and track it ourselves and uh, the most common method for doing this is called tagging or creating a discriminated union. Uh, a discriminated union is just a union that's wrapped up in a class or a structure and you wrap it up with an enum and you use that enum, that enumeration, to record the last data type that the union was accessed with or the, yeah, the type of data that's written in the union at a particular uh, time. There's other names for uh, tagged unions, variants, some types, whatever, you know. <laughs> I usually just say tagged union, but it doesn't often come up in conversation. This is my example of a tagged union. Okay, I'll just copy this code as well uh, over to C++ and we can go through it. And I'll delete all of this stuff. It was fun, but we're done now. The tagged union I've got here is uh, wrapped up in a class called tagged union. Um, the first thing I've got, the first public member is an enum uh, called data type, which is uh, or contains a list of the data types that the union below uh, can take on. So integer and float is the only ones in this example. If you had more data types, then you could just add them here. Um, whoops. Just like that, and then you'll put it down here as well. Just like that. Then your union could be an int, a float, or a double. Well, you've got to give it a variable name. Not F. Yeah, so this will be the enum, this, oh, sorry, this will be the uh, variable that we record the last data type to. And straight after that, we've got our actual union. So that's just exactly the same as before, an integer and a float union. Although I think I was calling them X and Y before. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so what you would do in order to, um, we'll create an instance of this class, you would just do that in the normal way. So we would say, um, uh, tagged union t that'll do to make a, an instance of this class uh, and if we want to set the the integer version of the union so if we want to use this union as an integer um, then you've got to do two things number one you've got to record that you are using the union as an integer so we can do that with um, t data type equals uh, tagged union uh, integer there we go, just like that. And the second step is to set the actual, you know, value of the union. So t dot i equals 100. There we go. And for a float, it's just as easy, except um, the data type becomes a float. And instead of accessing t i member variable, we're using it as a float, this union. So we'll uh, access t f, the float version. Uh, but there's nothing, you know, really difficult about it. And this way we've got a record in the data type member variable of this tagged union we've got a record of what data type the union holds and i think on the next yeah here we go so here's here's another little example of um, how you might use a tagged union so this is um, a really common way to use them um, to print them out what you might do is switch a switch based on that data type so let's just have a bit of a look um, alrighty, so print it out, print tagged union. So this method just here, if we um, if we use an integer uh, for our union t, and we say print tagged union. Let's see, print tagged union uh, t. Uh, it's going to do the uh, switch, figure out the data type, and print it out as an integer. And if we use a float. I shouldn't have deleted that float from before, but anyway, if we use a floating point data type as well, because we're tagging it, you know, we, we're setting the data type here, um, or we're setting a record of what data type we're using, um, it should print out 100 and 100. Let's have a look. Yeah, there you go. So no endals between, but there's two 100s there. So that's just how you um, use a switch, really, to uh, determine the data type of a tagged union. Good stuff.
Good stuff. All right, moving along. Uh, anonymous unions. This is really, really interesting, actually. So you can make uh, unions without names, and uh, that kind of lets you just use uh, variables, really, as unions. Yeah, so if we just copy this code just here and uh, have a bit of a go through it. This is an anonymous union, a union without a name. So you can't actually make one of these as a, whoops, you know, it's not a, it's not a user defined data type, so to speak, like a structure. Um, it's just a way to use A and B variables that take up the same uh, space in RAM. Yeah, let's just delete all this business. And uh, what's going to happen here? So we've got union int A int or float B. So we've got once again, a union of an integer and a float. Um, if we set A to 25, then we can print that out as an integer. Um, we can see out B as well, the float version, but you know, that's just going to print out gibberish um, since the float version of whatever 25 happens to be is probably nonsense. Uh, but likewise, we can use the um, same union um, as the variable B and set it to 26.9 and then print out A, the integer version. Well, that's just going to be nonsense. <laughs> Uh, or print out B, which is the float version, and that'll print out our 26.9. And we can also take the address of A and B down here. So let's just hit play and see what happens. We should see the same address. Yeah, there you go. So the, the 25 gets printed out, then we get nonsense. Uh, some tiny, tiny little number. Uh, the next thing that happens is uh, nonsense again. So this is the uh, integer bit pattern for 26.9 float. And uh, then we print out 26.9 as a float. And finally, we can just compare those two addresses there. So the output is, you know, almost entirely nonsense, but the, the two addresses there are exactly the same. Uh, meaning that we've got ourselves an anonymous union. How wonderful. How wonderful for us. Anonymous unions can't have member functions. I didn't go through it before, but um, you can actually put member functions with your unions exactly the same as a class or a structure. Uh, but anyway, anonymous unions can't have member functions and they have to have all of their members public and they also can't contain any static data. So there's a few extra restrictions on anonymous unions there, but I reckon it's pretty cool that you've got more than one variable to find in the same RAM. Do ya? <laughs> um, type punning, here we go, type punning. You could, this is I, this is really, I think, anyway, the best uh, example of how to use unions or where they really are the most useful. And it's, you know, it's debatably useless <laughs> anyway, but we'll go through it because it's quite cool. You can use unions to allow multiple names for the same data, as we've already seen, you know, three or four times. Um, but for instance, you might have a pixel that's encoded in RGBA 32-bit uh, color space. And you could store that as just an int, uh, but you also might want to access individual color channels as bytes. So it's you know it's pretty common that an unsigned integer would be used as a color, and you kind of write it out in hex, and you get these pairs of hex digits to mean the um, channels. Uh, but it might also be nice to use RGBA um, to access the channels, and you can do that with with a union. So this union right here is uh, a little example of that. Here we go, pixel, pixel union. All right, all we've got here is an integer that's um, aliased to f a little array of four bytes or four unsigned chars. Yeah, that's all we've got. So let's have a bit of a look at how you use this. Uh, on the next slide, here's an example of using the pixel struct, the pixel union, sorry. Um, alrighty, so we can declare an instance of pixel just with p, then we can set col, the integer version, to 11223344. That's this um, integer just here. And, oh, that's just to kind of set c out up to, to print out hex stuff. Um, after having set those channels to 1234, we can print out RGBA. And uh, what we should get is 11223344. Uh, yeah, then the other interesting thing that we can do is um, just add one to each channel very, very quickly uh, by using this little SIMD trick down here. Uh, P.col plus equals one uh, on each channel. That's actually going to add one to this 11 here and make it 12. It's going to add one to the 22 and make it 23. 
Um, yeah, all we're doing here is increasing the brightness of all four channels at once, but you know, that's going to wrap around and look really strange if you try it. It's interesting though, SIMD, SIMD. Um, let's just see what happens. All right, yeah, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. And straight after we've printed out RGBA uh, as separate channels, um, we add one to all of them. So the 11 becomes 12, the 44 becomes 45. Uh, in hex, it's not actually 45. Um, then we change the green channel to 99 in hex. Yeah, so it's it's just, it's interesting, or it's a good way to program really, because it's very fast. It allows you to do operations on the entire color as a single 32-bit integer. That's all four channels at once. But it also gives us the flexibility of working with each channel individually. So we could just add one to the green channel or, you know, just add the blue and the alpha channels together or something like that. Yeah, I hope that makes a bit of sense. So that, I think anyway, I think that's about the best uh, example of how a union is, is, is used when you, when you use it to alias. All right, it might be a good example, but here's why it's no good. <laughs> Punning or aliasing, as we just saw, uh, might seem like a good idea, but it's it's not really portable. And the trouble is endianness. So when a computer stores a, a multi-byte uh, piece of uh, or number, the order that it stores the bytes. Um, is not necessarily the same from machine to machine. So if you want to store the short integer 315, a big Endian system would store the first byte would be the biggest um, digits. So that's the 0 and 3 here. And the next byte after that in RAM would be the 1, 5. Um, that's if you're storing it at address 100. You'd have the, the 3 at, at address 100 and the 1, 5 at address 101. Whereas a little Endian system is normal, I'd argue, <laughs> but you know, uh, a little Endian system stores the smallest um, byte first. So that's the one five here, the least significant bits first. And the 03 would come, you know, at a higher address. The trouble is, the trouble is that we don't actually know um, what Endianness our system is uh, is using. So if we do something like before with our pixel, and we define col, and we pass you know this number just here, this four four three three two two one one, we don't actually know if this one one is going to be set to R the R byte or if it's going to be set to A the alpha channel. We don't know. Uh, on a big Endian system, it'll go straight to the alpha channel. On a little Endian system, like x86, it'll go to the red component. But the point is that we don't know. There's a really good chance that the system that you're using is um, little Endian, and you're pretty much safe in assuming that you'll um, only run on little Endian desktops. Uh, and also, uh, ARM CPUs are little Endian. Uh, but there is a bunch of different circumstances where big Endian is the way to go. So. It's a bit of a nightmare, really, and what the... Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so we don't actually know. You can easily check in a program. If you want to know if it's little endian or big endian, then you can just say, like, int i equals 1, and then check in RAM where the 1 is. Um, uh, if we say, like, char star c equals, and then char star at the address of that, um, if this C value just here is a 1, then you're little Endian. <laughs> then you're little Endian. Uh, what am I doing? Int. And if it's 0, then you're not little Endian. You're big Endian. Yeah, there you go. So it's a 1. x86 is little Endian. Surprise, surprise. Don't know why we went through that. <laughs> the next thing that I want to go through, and really the final thing that I want to go through, is um, something on padding. So this doesn't often come up when people are talking about um, unions, but but it should because you know it's it's uh, it's interesting and it's important. Sometimes we've got to be careful about how data is laid out. Uh, compilers often add extra bytes of padding to structures and classes. And this might make it difficult to know exactly how a union will alias one structure to another. So what we did before with our pixels and our characters, 
Um, that was called uh, aliasing. We're just aliasing, uh, well, we're using more than one name for the same variable. And if you're aliasing with structures, things can get tricky. Alrighty, so I want you to create the following structures. I'll create, I'll, I'll create them as well. I'm sure you're going along with me doing this as well. We're having a good old time, we are. <laughs> okay, one of us is. Struct one, struct two, there we go. Um, all right, now I want you to union the two together and set uh, one of them. All right, I'll just copy this code and then we'll get back to the slides in just a second. So union the two together. So we make a union just there and just there like that. So we've got a union of those two structures. The first structure has got a short and then a double called A and B. The next structure has got a char and a double called C and D. We union those two structures together and we set the B value of S1, the first structure to 99.9 .9. but the question is what does that do to s2 see if we're aliased then we can use s1 and s2 without recording what type of data is in there um, but the question is what happens uh, well I can tell you what happens uh, it's just going to set the um, D value to 99.9 .9. but it's not immediately obvious why it would do that let's have a bit of a print out and see what see that it does do what I whoa um, see that it does do what I reckon. So we want to print out uh, union s2 dot d and drum roll. This should be 99.9. .9. Yeah, there you go. 99.9. .9. Uh, good stuff. So if we just hit stop and come back to the slides, we can probably see why. Um, this is what they actually look like in RAM. So this is 16 bytes of RAM. This is zero over the side here. Uh, all the way up to byte 15 and what you see is that the S1 structure with the short and the double did something really weird it's going to use the first two bytes for that short and then it's going to skip six bytes absolutely nothing in there just do nothing with them they're nothing but padding wasted RAM <laughs> and it's going to put the double at uh, bytes 8 to 15 and S2 is going to do much the same thing, except it's only going to use the first uh, byte for the character member variable, and then it's going to put the um, whoops, whoa, the double in uh, bytes eight to fifteen. Yeah, so that's yeah, that's pretty much exactly what it did. You can see that they both, like struct one and struct two, both used the top um, eight bytes for the double. That's why we could just write to. Um, S1's B value and read it from S2's D value. Alrighty. Uh, but you might also want to use Pragma Pack. So Pragma Pack is from uh, Microsoft compilers originally, but it's pretty widely supported as well. So if you're using GNU or a bunch of other compilers, you'll have Pragma Pack. This directive allows us to eliminate padding altogether between the structures. So what we saw on the previous slide, these green bytes in here are called padding. Yeah, they're just added to make reading this double easier. Um, not for us, you know, not for the programmer. They're added to make it easier to read for the um, compiler and the program itself. So you can use Pragma Pack. It's not standard C++, but it's supported by a lot of compilers. Uh, it's not 100% portable, and if you want to go 100% portable, then don't use Pragma Pack. Yeah. That's all I would say. But here's an example of what Pragma Pack would do. So if we use Pragma Pack around our um, structures and Pragma Pop down the bottom there, then we can pretty much do exactly the same thing as we did before. Actually, what's interesting is if we take the uh, size of, so C out um, size of, where is it? If we see out the size of struct two, we'll see that even though it's even though it's only really nine bytes, you know, it's a character and a, and a double. It takes up 16 bytes of RAM. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but like I was saying, you can just pragma pack as well. So let's pragma pack the daylights out of it. Let's, let's learn how to copy first, eh? <laughs> Oops, forgot my comma. Okay, you do need a comma there in pragma pack push. Oh, this is just, I'm making the slides while you're watching. How embarrassing. Um, all right, so now that we've packed our data together, what we'll get is no padding between the character and the double here in struct two. So when we take the size of, 
we'll get uh, what? Eight bites for the double and one for the character. We'll get nine bites. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so you can get rid of the padding altogether if you like. And what we could do here is add our own padding. There we go. So we know the struct one's short is two bytes long. And this character just here is one byte long. So if we wanted to ensure that in our union we can alias properly um, without necessarily using the default padding, well, we could just add our own single character of padding. And the B and D doubles would um, be aliased to each other, just like they were originally. Uh, this is what the two look like. Um, this is struct one and struct two when we union, union them together with um, with pragma pack. Yeah, so zero to one is S one's um, short, and the character from C. Uh, but the interesting thing is that um, the top eight bytes are used for struct one's double. Um, but the top byte isn't used at all for struct two. Yeah, the top byte will use, or the top, sorry, struct two will use bytes one to eight for its double D. Yeah, so double D just here, and uh, the double B are no longer aliased to each other. Interesting stuff on packing. Okay, the conclusion. This is all my opinion, but I think that um, unions are more interesting than they are useful. You can pretty much do what a union does just using a class and some pointer casting. And in order to use aliasing, you have to be aware of endianness often. And the systems that you're coding might be big endian or small endian. You might also want to know how your compiler pads things if you're intending to alias. And that might change in the future too. So yeah, aliasing is it's shaky ground, really. It's shaky ground. And really, it's it's one of the best uses for unions. So I think in the end, all you can say is that unions aren't that useful. Uh, I like the idea of unions in C++ much more than unions themselves. I think that interoperability demands really hold unions back from being as useful as the, as they could be. And I personally never, never really use them uh, outside of ASM where everything is a union. <laughs> um, the pixel aliasing example is okay, but I think if it gets any more complicated than that, I'd tend to stick with classes. Cheers all. Thanks for watching. See ya.